Welcome back everyone. My name is Pedron and this is where we do machine learning codes and concepts. Let's get started. All right, so we are done with supervised machine learning models that I wanted to cover for this course. So through 10 modules, we covered some of the models from this very simple linear regression model to the most advanced ones like XGBoost, CatBoost, and LightGBM. But before we move on to the second part, which is basically unsupervised machine learning models, we need to be aware that we cannot apply, we cannot apply these machine learning models blindly to time series data set, right? So when it comes to time series, there are some challenges, which is not unique to any specific model. So it applies to all these models. So in this video, I want to talk about those time series challenges and show you how you can handle it. And later on in my deep forecasting course, I'm going to do extended videos, you know, how to prepare data set for time series and how basically we can use these models when it comes to time series. So in this video, let's keep it short and simple and at least address those time series challenges. And then now when you go out and work with these models, you're aware if the data set is time series, you have to do some further steps. Okay, so let's look into the details of those challenges. Okay, challenges in time series machine learning. So as I stated earlier, these time series challenges apply to all the supervised machine learning models that we have talked about it so far. When it comes to the time series machine learning, there are some challenges that you might face down the road and which are not necessarily widely or commonly covered in textbooks or courses out there. So these challenges are the ones that if you're doing time series analysis, you should be very aware and it's, it's, it might make a big difference in terms of model performance. So in a nutshell, I, I, I'm going to highlight the most important ones that at, at least I think these are the most important ones. But the, the challenges for time series is not limited to these ones that I listed here. So the first one is uh, non-stationarity, right? So we know that many time series data exhibit non-stationary behavior. This means that the statistical properties like the mean and variance of the data changes over time. So this can make it difficult to model the data and make accurate predictions. So we have to take into account this concept of non-stationarity because if the data set is non-stationary, not necessarily all the extrapolations are valid, right? So we know that extrapolating in the, into the future may not necessarily to be valid if the data set is basically non-stationary. The second one is seasonality, right? So we know that time series, you know, quite often shows the regular patterns and these patterns can be daily, weekly, or in terms of, for example, stock market, it can be hourly by minutes and, uh, or yearly seasonality, right? So these patterns sometimes can be difficult and tricky to model and can lead to errors in predictions if we aren't, if, if we don't take into account these kind of seasonality. So we should be aware of those things as well. The next one is, well, this is also limited to any kind of data set, but it's more emphasized in time series data set. And that's, that's the amount of data available. Uh, let's call it limited data, right? So time series data are often collected over a limited time period, which can make it difficult to train a model with sufficient amount of data. And probably this is one of the reasons that even as of today, you know, the state of the art neural networks architectures like transformers, they cannot easily outbid some uh, even simple econometric time series models or boosting algorithms when it comes to handling structured time series, right? So maybe the, the, one of the main reason is that the time series data is kind of limited. It's, it's unlike the other type of data set that we have. And then finally, and I think that maybe this is the most important one, is basically your time series, as the name suggests, the data is time dependent, right? So this time dependency is basically, the, it means that the next value of your observation depends on the previous value, right? And this characteristic makes the problem harder to solve than regular and other regular supervised learning models, right? And this, this means that when you're doing cross-validations, right? So if you're doing, for example, k-fold cross-validation, within each fold, you cannot simply shuffle the data. Or when you're using bootstrap, you cannot simply shuffle the data because, uh, because simply the time series are not IID. So there are different ways and techniques that we should use when it comes to cross-validation, when it comes to bootstrapping, and we have to apply these methods when we are ensembling, the, for example, decision trees, right? So in the previous part, when we talked about boosted, uh, boosted algorithm, we said that, okay, at the end of the day, we are ensembling a bunch of trees, we are bootstrapping over them, 
and we look at the performance of the model to, by looking at the cross-validation performance, right? So when it comes to these the concepts, we have to be very careful that for time series, cross-validation is different. You know, we have to do it differently simply because the data is not IID. The bootstrapping is also different. So let's take a look into these concepts in more detail, starting with stationarity. Okay, so for those who might not be quite familiar with the concept of stationarity and what makes a data stationary, maybe this visualization help. You know, it's it's a, it's a quite simple concept. In a stationary time series, we say that the statistical properties do not depend on time, right? So what do we mean? So look at an example where the data shows stationarity. So this is a data, stationary data. And as you can see, you know, it, it seems that the average, you know, let's say the average is sitting around here, over time is kind of constant, the variance is kind of constant, and the autocorrelation or covariance between each two points in time, at least visually here, seems to be constant. If you want to see uh, how it looks for non-stationary data, basically, if there is a trend and seasonality in the data, that data set is not going to be stationary. Why? Because, for example, in this data set, we, have, we see trends, right? We see trend and seasonality. And if you look at the average in any, let's say, for any window period in time, so here maybe this is the average, and the average is increasing, right? So as you can see, this average is not constant over time. And in this, in the other, in the other example, so in this plot, as you can see, the variance is not constant over time. Maybe average is constant, but the problem is that the variance is changing when I go from time to time. If I look at the period of, let's say, 10, 10 period uh, frequency, right? And then finally, in this example, as you can see, maybe the average is constant, maybe the variance is constant, but the covariance or autocorrelation is not constant. It simply means that the relationship between current value and the past value might be different at different points in time. So maybe I'm looking at the correlation, autocorrelation between these two points, and if I want to look at the same window, so maybe these two points and then these two points, the autocorrelation, as you can see, it's changing, right? So basically, if average, variance, and correlation or autocorrelation is changing over time, that data set is non-stationary. And what, what's, what's, what's the, ca well, I don't want to call it problem, what, what's the issue with non-stationary data and makes it more difficult to predict, especially, for example, for a stock market, right? Uh, the reason is that um, at any point, so for example, let's, let's look at this data set. Let's look at this one. And imagine, regardless of what model you use, machine learning, deep learning, you name it, you have a train set validation set, test set, right? And in time series, your train set can be something like this. And then we're going to talk about cross-validation in the future slides, but whatever it is, it's going to be uh, something, uh, let's say, in this range, right? Or even in the full range of the data. But when it comes to predicting futures, right? So in the futures, the data is taking some values that the model has not seen that those values for observations in the entire training, validation, or even cross-validation process, right? So that's what makes it a little challenging when it comes to the forecasting yeah, non-stationary data set, right? So for example, when it comes to stock market, we know that it's not stationary necessarily, and it's it's difficult, or if, it, if not impossible, to make stock market price predictions. There are some hopes when it comes to stock market return predictions, simply because returns are stationary, and it's easier to model those kind of time series. Okay, so what are cross-validation techniques in time series? Remember, you know, with time series, especially if it is a stationary, we simply cannot shuffle the data because time series are autocorrelated and they are not IID, right? Even if the data is stationary, there's still some time dependencies, like in ARIMA models, right? After all, it's not, it's not quite a white noise, so we need to use different cross-validation methods, right? And uh, so basically the main reason is that we cannot shuffle the data, and even if you can shuffle the data, there's still some time dependencies, and we also then we need to make sure that we have to avoid data leakage, right? So we're going to talk about data leakage in the next slide, but in a nutshell, data leakage happens when the training sets and test sets are sharing some information, right? So imagine this is our k-fold cross-validation. We need to make sure that you know, there is no data leakage between train set and test set, right, in these points. 
So there are ways to fix that when it comes to time series, right? So based on these requirements, we're going to deal with uh, different cross-validation methods for time series. But the, the three most commonly used ones or the ones that work in practice uh, are these ones, right? So the first one is purge k-fold cross-validation. The second one, which most probably you have seen this before, is uh, walk forward rolling or expanding windows cross-validation. And the third one is combinatorial purge cross-validation, which is, this is actually a quite interesting one, which was developed by Marcus Lopez de Prado, uh, which he talks about this method in his fantastic books, which is called uh, Advances in Financial Machine Learning. Okay, so let's look into the first one. Purge k-fold cross-validation. So the idea of purge k-fold cross-validation is all about data leakage, right? And as, we, as I said earlier, leakage takes place when the training set contains information that also appears in the test set, right? Because this is time series, right? After all, t and t plus 1 are serially correlated. And if you tend to put them in different buckets, then these buckets are, have some data leakage into each other, right? So this is not surprising at all. And what's the problem of leakage? The problem is that leakage will enhance your model performance. So this is, you're going to get fake model performance, right? So what is the solution? And actually, let me show you this one. So imagine this is your train set. And obviously, you have a non-stationary data set here, the time series here. So let's say we have train set, test set, and again, another train set. And we can go ahead and multiply it into multiple train and test splits, right? And as you can see, there is this overlap. So what is the solution? The solution is what uh, Marcus Lopez do Prado called purging and embargoing in his book, Advances in Financial Machine Learning, right? So and the idea is quite simple. So purging is, so if you, if you pay attention to this green shaded areas, so purging happens basically to reduce the data leakage we are going to remove observations or purge observations from the train set that have overlap with the test set. Remember, this is our, let me use the right marker. This is our train, this is test, this is train again, right? So the idea is that remove these observations that overlap between train and test. So we're going to have cushions. Let me use the right color. Okay, we're going to have an extra cushion here, an extra cushion here, right? So this is the idea of purging. So what is embargoing? And the embargoing is, so we are going to add an extra buffer or extra cushion right after the test set and right before the train set to make sure that these serial correlations are avoided or minimized, right? So this is the idea of purging and embargoing. Now, if we apply this uh, purging and embargoing things to k-fold cross-validation, this technique is called purged k-fold cross-validation. Basically, by adding purging and embargoing, whenever we produce a train test split in our k-fold cross-validation, let's say I have my own uh, five-fold cross-validation, right? So one, two, three, four, five. And every single time that you see a train test split, you're going to apply purge and uh, embargoing. So, for example, here, right after test, we're going to have uh, here, we're going to have purge, embargo, and then we are going to have purge, purge, embargo. We're going to have purge, purge, embargo, and et cetera, right? And we're going to apply this and then uh, calculate the performance on the test set in each fold. And just like any other k-fold cross-validation, we are going to combine these performances. For example, take the average if it is, let's say, RMSE, and then call it the cross-validation performance metric. All right. The second uh, cross-validation techniques for time series is walk forward, right? We can have two forms of walk forward cross-validation. One is using rolling windows on the right, and the other one is using expanding windows. So starting from the walk forward cross violation rolling windows or sliding windows, we can say in this method, you know, the data is split into a series of overlapping windows. And as you can see, these ones have overlap, right? Where each window represents a train set and the following window represents the corresponding test set, right? So we have, you know, we have our train set and the following one is going to be our test set. So the size of the test set is fixed. The size of the rolling window, it can be fixed. It can be uh, different, right? So these sizes can, can change. Well, we, we are going to use the, this sliding uh, walk forward cross validation when the data set, uh, maybe have a large number of observations, right? 
And when we have large number of observations and to avoid a structural changes over time series, we would be using rolling windows, right? Because, you know, especially when it comes to stock market, you know, Apple 10 years ago is different from Apple today, right? So it's not useful to use by useful. Uh, it's not quite practical to use information from 10 years ago necessarily uh, when you want to apply uh, study what's the behavior of Apple stock price today, right? So maybe you should use rolling windows of one year or six months, right? So that's that's the idea of walk forward rolling windows cross violation. And for expanding, that's basically similar to a sliding window, but the training set is expanded with each iteration, right? So as you can see, this is your train set first and we're gonna expand it, we're gonna expand it and etc. And we keep the size of the test sets uh, similar. So this method is used when you have limited time series available, right? So if you have a small data set, there is no structural change in the time series, you can apply walk forward. But regardless, if you use rolling or expanding, there are some advantages and disadvantages for this cross validation technique. So let's talk about the advantages. So maybe the biggest advantage of walk forward cross validation is it has a clear historical interpretation, right? Basically, especially if you're doing backtesting, it is consistent with the historical backtesting and paper trading, right? So you see, for example, in expanding window, you see from day one to day T, and you observe one full path of the data, and this is basically your historical data, right? And uh, so we can say that history is, is acting some sort of like a filtration, and the test that is completely uh, out of sample, right? So here at each fold, at each cross validation fold, we're seeing test set is completely separate from the train. And because test set is always coming after the train set, we don't need to do any kind of embargoing, but we need to do some purging, right? So we need to do some purging to make sure that there is no data leakage, okay? So these are the advantages. What is the disadvantage? So the disadvantage, and again, maybe the biggest one is that it's a, what's called a single scenario test. It's uh, it's basically show you the historical path. There is it, It's gonna generate one path from day one to day T. And usually this is your historical data. And when it comes to trading, this the model can overfit. The model can overfit if there's only one path, right? So the solution is what we call combinatorial, uh, cross-validation, that's basically the idea of combinatorial cross-validation is to generate multiple of these paths that makes your performance metrics more robust, you know, with a smaller variance, right? So that's the first disadvantage. The second disadvantage, which only applies to the expanding window is basically the initial decisions are made on a smaller proportion of the data, right? So for example, here, whatever we are doing in the first fold, you know, the, the decision is based on this train set, then next one, then next one. And as, as you can see, the initial decisions are based on a fewer observations. So we don't have this problem with the rolling window, but the problem with the rolling window is that these the folds are not necessarily large, right? So again, this is advantages and disadvantages of walk forward cross violation, but this is one of those cross violation techniques that it's most widely used and it works. You know, if the data, if time series is stationary and this, this technique works just fine. And this is the one that comes with many Python packages like uh, PyCarrot, like uh, scikit-learn and et cetera. All right, the last one is called CPCV, Combinatorial Purge Cross-Validation, okay? So this one is quite unique, especially when it comes to backtesting trading strategies, and it's very helpful because it gives us multiple backtest paths that, in, that span the entire data set. So what I mean by that, so let me emphasize it one more time. The goal in CPCV is to generate multiple unique backtest paths that span the entire data set. Remember, in purge cross-validation or in walk forward cross-validation, we went through day one to day T, uh, capital letter T, only once. That was basically your historical data. And especially when it comes to backtesting tra trading strategy, it can overfit, it can simply overfit. But the idea of combinatorial purge cross-validation is we're gonna, we're gonna do something like this. Imagine, imagine, let's look at, uh, let's look at this one actually. I'm gonna tell you what, is, what do we mean by S and what are the different things on the, on the vertical axis, we call them group. So imagine you have, I don't know, 700 something observations, right? Let's call it 700 observation. And I'm gonna divide it into six groups. So let's say group one, two, three, four, 
five, six, six groups that uh, within these groups, we are not supposed to shuffle the data, right? So let's say you can think of these groups as months, right? So groups can be in this example months, right? So we don't want to shuffle the data within each month, right? And I have six groups here. So my G is equal to six and I want to test. So I want to keep two months of these six months as for my test set, right? For one, for all these 700 observations, right? So let's say I want to say, I want to test two groups or two months. So how many different ways can I do that? It's a combination of two of six, right? So two of six is going to be the, basically 15 different ways, right? Six multiply five divided by two. And so now that this is where these uh, S's are, are coming from, S1 through S15, right? So these are basically different splitting ways we can have if you have six groups that you don't want to you don't want to uh, shuffle them and you want to uh, for each cross validation you want to use two of them as a test set right so we're going to end up with 15 different splitting methods right so now out of these 15 different splitting methods we can come up in this example we can come up with five unique path so basically here, this is, and let's go ahead and label them with numbers. So this is unique path that spans the entire data uh, from let's say month one to month six, day zero to let's, I don't know, 700, the unit is different, right? So this is path number one, path number two, path number three, number four, number five, uh, and, and et cetera, right? So again, there's a formula where we can get this number five here, but uh, whatever it is, at, at the end of the day, using CPCV, now combinatorial purge cross validation, we were able to generate in this example five unique paths that span the entire data set. So what's quite unique about this approach is that it will help us to avoid overfitting and uh, basically we don't get super optimistic performance metrics, right? So this is really, really important. So, and remember in each path, that we generated in this exa example, we had five, we can look at the models out of sample performance for the entire time period. All right, now let's move on to time series bootstrapping. As we discussed earlier, because there is this time dependencies in time series data, to note, IID bootstrapping is simply does not work because we cannot uh, shuffle the data randomly. And uh, so we know that the bootstrapping is random sampling with replacement. So if there is time dependency, we cannot do that. So what do we use for time series bootstrapping methods? There are two general types of bootstrapping methods for time series. One is parametric, the other one is non-parametric. Parametric ones are simply based on models, right? So we're going to work with models with IID residuals and resample from those residuals. So let's say, for example, we have an autoregressive model or a REMA model. Uh, we fit the uh, data and then we come up with the residuals. The residuals are going to be IID and we're going to simulate back from those residuals, right? So we're going to simulate a synthetic time series from those residuals, right? And so this is a parametric approach. The second approach is non-parametric, right? So in non-parametric, we are basically we're going to call them block bootstrap and and it is where the data is directly resampled, right? So the underlying assumption is that these blocks can be sampled so that they are approximately IID. Yes, the data set, the time series itself is not IID, but we're going to uh, put them in different blocks and then we assume that those blocks are IID, right? So depending on how we define those blocks, we can come up with different uh, non-parametric uh, block bootstrap techniques. And uh, we're going to cover three of them here, you know, 
moving block bootstrap MBB, circular block bootstrap CBB, and a stationary bootstrap SB. Okay, so the first one, moving block bootstrap MBB. MBB samples overlapping fixed size blocks, and the size is M of M consecutive observations, right? So the idea is that, so imagine this is our observed data, and we are dealing with overlapping fixed size. So this is one block, here is another block, you get the idea, different colors, right? So in this example, we're going to have five blocks with fixed size, whatever the size is. Then we're going to put them together, we call it resample blocks, and then we are going to sort them in a way that the, the, uh, the length of the resampled blocks is the same as the length of the observational data, right? This is, our, this is going to be our bootstrap data. And now we can repeat this process many, many times. We can generate many, many bootstrap observations, right? And just pay attention that the blocks indices starts from number one to number t minus m plus one. So what does that mean? Imagine we have, here we have uh, on the left-hand side, we have nine observations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? And imagine our m is equal to three. The block size, the fixed block size that can be in the overlapping is three, right? So this is block number one, block number two, and etc. right? So the index of the, the block bootstraps is gonna start from index number one. So here, this is index number one, and it goes all the way to index number, capital letter T minus M plus one. So RT is nine, M is three plus one. So this is index seven. This is the uh, start of the last block available in the data, right? So basically index seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is our, going to be our last block. And as you can see, uh, maybe one thing that you may uh, notice that the, la the very last block is going to be, only, the observations here are, are going to only be repeated uh, once in this block, right? So maybe we should fix this problem, and this is exactly the motivation for circular block, right? The circular block assumes that the data lives in a circle, and now we can connect uh, the first observation to the very last observation, and we can build more blocks on top of that then the, the, the very last observations are going to be repeatedly uh, the same amount of time compared to the other part of the data observations. So here is the CBB, circular block bootstrap. You know, as I said, it's a simple extension to the MBB, and which assumes that the data lives in a circle. So it, this is your T1, and it goes all the way to T capital letter T last period, and then it goes back to T1 again. So this helps, uh, this, first of all, it makes sure that uh, uh, your bootstrap has better finite sample properties because all the data points get sampled with equal probability. Remember, in moving block, let's say, in moving block bootstrap, the, the very last observations have fewer chance to show up in the data. But if I make it circular, then they have, they're going to be repeated in a few forward uh, blocks and they have equal chance of showing up in the bootstrap. So this is uh, the caveat of MBB, which is covered by uh, CBB, circular uh, block bootstrap. Uh, all right, the last one is a stationary bootstrap. So stationary bootstrap is, again, simply an extension to moving block bootstrap, but here the block size is no longer fixed. So if you remember, in our previous example, our block size was equal to three. So we had the data, and we came up with blocks of three observations. You know, they could overlap, something like this. But now, the in stationary bootstrap, we are going to choose an average block size of M. So we're going to say that on average, the block size is three. So maybe I have a block of two, and then I have a block of, I don't know, maybe without overlapping four. And as you can see, the average is going to be three. So the idea is that we can have different size blocks. And what makes it interesting is that if this stationary bootstrap is applied to a stationary data, our resample pseudo time series. Remember, the bootstrap data, you, you can, this is a synthetic time series, right? This new pseudo time series is going to be stationary. And this is very, very important because that's not the case for moving block bootstrap or circular block bootstrap. So, in many cases, we transform the data, the time series data, to be stationary first. And then now, if you want to apply any kind of bootstrapping, the pseudo time series better be stationary, right? Because you want to, for example, you're applying some ARIMA models. ARIMA works under the assumption that the time series is bootstrap, is stationary. And now if you want to look at the performance of the model the, in simulated data, your simulated data, 
or synthetic data better be stationary, right? And I think one last thing I want to emphasize that the popularity of stationary bootstrap is coming from the fact that it is hard to come up with the optimal value for a fixed uh, block size of M, right? And this is going to leave your hands, uh, it's going to give you more room to just focus on the average value of that M. And then you can change the size of these blocks. To, uh, it can be any number, right? And this, by the way, the last property that we talked about, and uh, what, when a stationary bootstrap is applied to a stationary data set, the synthetic data is going to be stationary. Uh, it, can, it can be mathematically proved. Actually, there's a paper that covers this. Uh, if you're interested, you can look up the proof on the paper. All right, I think that's pretty much it. These are all the topics that I wanted to cover when it comes to time series machine learning and what are the challenges in time series machine learning. So with time series challenges behind us, we should be now ready to move on to uh, unsupervised learning models. Until the next one, take care.